Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Saffron. You're watching Kitco News. If you haven't already, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to our channel for the latest. Now today on the show, in a significant shift in U.S. tax policy, President Biden's 2025 budget proposal includes a significant increase in the capital gains tax. Now he's proposing a top rate of 44.6% for individuals with a taxable income over $1 million, this marking one of the highest rates since the 1920s. Meanwhile, in Canada, a similar contentious proposal under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau could see capital gain taxes increase up to 67% on gains, over $250,000, which has many people concerned. Now, Biden still has to pass this bill through an angry Congress, with many publicly against the tax increase. But in Canada, Prime Minister Trudeau's Liberal Party holds a minority government, meaning that they could pass this proposed capital gains tax increase with the support from the NDP party and have given a deadline of June 25th for this to take effect. Now, there's also a critical difference between the two proposals, which we will break down. While the U.S. proposal targets a specific income group, Canada's broader approach could affect a wider segment of the population. Doctors and entrepreneurs are already speaking out. Now, critics argue that such increase could stifle our economy, small businesses, and our innovation, suggesting that these are not just taxes on the rich, but measures that could have broader economic repercussions for everyone. And joining us to discuss these developments is Daryl Ching. He's a chartered financial analyst, also the owner and CEO at Vistance Capital Advisory. Daryl, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm looking forward to having you on. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. Now, I really want you to help unpack this, not only for our audience, but also for me here. Uh, first, let's start with the U.S. President Biden's proposing to align the capital gains tax with the highest income bracket at 44.6% for those earning $1 million. Uh, explain the U.S. proposal to us and what shifts we might see in strategies here for those earners. Well, there's a small silver lining to that announcement because it's only on the short-term capital gains tax. So it will certainly affect people who do trading on a stock portfolio, who hold mm -hmm. investments for less than a year. And then they will be, you know, for, uh, the tax rate going from 37 to 44 is somewhat substantial. Now, the 25% on unrealized gains is a much bigger issue because what that means is even if you don't sell your investment, in the short term and you still hold on to it but you have an unrealized gain meaning the market value has gone up by a certain amount you can still get taxed on it even though you haven't sold the asset yet so i, I would say that that component is more substantial yeah talk to me a little bit more about this though daryl let's break down that you know this unrealized uh, if you got the inclusion of a 25 percent tax on unrealized capital gains for households worth more than a hundred million dollars isn't this going to lead to some liquidity issues? I mean, talk to me a little bit about what this really means. Yes, I mean, it's going to lead to liquidity issues as well because, you know, typically if you have a stock portfolio that is a sit and hold strategy where you hold a bunch of stocks but you don't sell, um, you typically don't have to pay capital gains. You only generally have to pay capital gains when you sell your, your stocks or sell your assets. In this case, you can simply have to, you, you'll have to pay even with any monetary increase in value on, on your portfolio. So this will be a considerable shift. When you talk about uh, uh, the value in terms of like a hundred, hundred million dollar households, you're looking at probably a range of 25% increase in tax payments above and beyond what people would have expected to pay initially in terms of capital gains. So that is quite substantial. Yeah, I mean, let's compare the U.S. proposal to Canada's for a moment, just to give a little bit of context. I mean, Canada's increase at 67% on capital gains over 250. So I'm going to try and break this down. Then we'll go to you. Bear with me. You know, previously in Canada, the tax system offered a break where only half of your capital gains were taxed. And the rest was yours to keep. Now, the new budget slashes this break dramatically, right? Now, you'll only keep one third of your gains tax free. The other two thirds, they're grabbing it back. Yeah, so let me break it down in a different way. Mm -hmm. Initially, the proposal was that Canada with 50% of your capital gains was taxable at your personal income tax rate. And when you're looking at entrepreneur selling businesses, we're talking about millions of dollars in, in terms of the sale. The highest income tax bracket in Canada is just north of 50%, no matter what province you're in. So if you go 50% times 50%, effectively, your effective tax rate was 25% on capital gains. All said and done. Now they're saying that with the new proposal, the Canadian government deems two thirds of your capital gains to be taxable. 
So if you take two thirds times 50%, you're now looking at 33%. So effectively, the effective tax rate has gone from 25% to 33%. To put things into perspective, the long-term capital gains tax rate in the US at the highest level is 20%. And if you hit certain income levels, there may be a 3.8% surplus. So you're at 23.8. So prior to this announcement, Canada and US were pretty close. There was 23.8% in the US versus 25% in Canada. Canada has now shot up to 33%. So effectively, you are now paying 10% more on capital gains in Canada than you are in the US on a long-term investment. And that could be real estate. That could be a business that you started and held for 10 years and then sold. And if you're talking about a $5 million sale, that in itself could mean an additional payment of $500,000 in taxes, which is substantial in Canada with far reaching implications. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the US too, we talked about those two notable differences uh, on the gains side, but which approach do you think has a more significant potential to impact high earners, but also business investors negatively here? Because I mean, we're already in this world where overregulation is happening. I'm just curious, you know, between the US and Canada here, are they gonna pass? What's going on? Well, you know, from a political perspective, I think, it gets a bit easier to pass when you focus on capital gains because there is this perception in the marketplace that this is a tax on the rich. Right. But I do believe that that you know, view is oversimplified because there is some merit to that. Obviously, people that own yachts and multiple uh, investment properties are going to get hit. But if you look at the entrepreneur, a lot of us that start businesses don't start wealthy. In fact, mm -hmm. we often have to put up our life savings. Sometimes we go into debt to start a business in the hope of maybe making a successful exit in the future where 90% of businesses fail. And you know, when you look into what entrepreneurs go through, we get into situations where we have to stop paying ourselves. Uh, sometimes we have to mortgage, uh, to do a second mortgage or take out more debt in order to continue paying our employees, keep the lights on. So with this risk, isn't that fair? to suggest that if we are the small fraction of entrepreneurs that make it successfully, make an exit, that we should be able to keep most of this capital. And I think that's the segment of the population that is really the, impacted the most. Mm -hmm. Because if you also think about it, small businesses uh, contribute about 67% of the employment in Canada. And that's about businesses with less than 100 employees. So think about the knock-on effect if entrepreneurs decide A, not to start a business in Canada, or even B, the existing businesses decide to pack up and move to a different jurisdiction, what impact that would have on the labor market in Canada in general? Yeah, you know, before we get into the small business impact, because there's a huge amount there we need to unpack, I'm curious just about regular guys like you and me. I mean, you know, regular Canadians, Americans, uh, we're talking about, I mean, even though in Canada, your primary home or residence is exempt, Many Canadians mm -hmm. could feel the impact of this tax change. You know, we're already seeing some real estate selling off before this deadline through the sale of cottages and secondary residences, you know, rental properties. It isn't just taxing the rich here. It's a tax on the middle class. And I'm curious about that because it's people that have acquired some of these investments for their retirement. Well, capital gains is an impact on any investment that you can have. And to suggest that only rich people have investments is benign. Mm -hmm. So... You know, uh, so I, I, from my perspective, even the middle class people have portfolios where they have uh, own stocks, they own bonds, they own, and you know, sometimes you own an investment property. Well, th in the U.S., that short term capital gain hit is really more of a hit on short term trades, but going from from thirty five to to forty two percent, that is a pretty substantial increase in tax in itself on the equity portfolio when you choose to sell. And the, as I mentioned, the 25% unrealized gain portion is uh, pretty is pretty substantial as well. It's huge. What it's going to do? It's going to discourage investment. Uh, in turn, like you know, from our perspective, the reason why capital gains generally is taxed less is because there's a perceived risk mm -hmm. in that there is a possibility of losing the investment, losing money, and that is really the reason behind why uh, that. The, it is taxed lower than, for example, for salaries. Yeah. And so when you start making investments less attractive, you start to see less investment in R&D. 
less investments in building a small business to employ people. Um, and from the middle class side, you're looking at paying a lot more taxes on just your general portfolio of assets that could contain stocks, bonds, and other general investments as well. Yeah. You know, I wonder how much of this is just political. It seems like Justin Trudeau is looking for a vote everywhere he can kind of grab it these days, especially in a time where we have so much debt. This seems to be compounded with this. You know, let's go back to that small business for a second, because, you know, the stat is, is as of 2022, there were 1.21 million total businesses in Canada, 1.19 million or 97.9%, almost 80 or sorry, almost 98% were small businesses. That's a very substantial role in, can in Canada's economy. So I'm a little bit curious here. What do we got to lose? I mean, is this going to be job creations, economic growth? We have a lot of people in the tech industry and in innovative industries coming out today and saying, this is stifling us. It's absolutely stifling. And then like, now let's look at existing business owners. For our business owners right now that are sitting there looking at these changes in the tax code, they're saying, wow. So if I successfully sell my business, if I grow my business to $10 million and I sell it, I am now paying a third effectively in taxes. Yeah. Is there another jurisdiction that I should move to that has a more favorable tax regime in which I can maintain more, more where I can I keep more of my wealth upon exit? And then there are the entrepreneurs sitting on the sidelines that are saying, I'm thinking about starting a business, but... I have to weigh these factors into consideration in terms of what is the risk reward. I am aware of the amount of risk I am taking. I'm aware of how much pain I can put myself through, through this process to try, try to create a successful business. But I don't know if I want to do that anymore. Yeah. So in terms of when you say the, when you use the word stifling, you're talking about, you know, making it much more difficult for entrepreneurs to pull that trigger and start a business or even stay in the country. Mm -hmm. Well, talk to me a little bit about this investment climate and maybe some capital flight. I mean, we already have issues with our capital markets in terms of liquidity, even the amount of eyeballs. If we think about foreign investments, often we talk to business leaders and they already look to Canada as being overregulated and they're already unsure of bringing their business here. Is this going to impact future business here? It is because, you know, not so much on foreign investors because a lot of foreign investors are taxed based on their own jurisdiction. But if you look at domestic investors, so you're looking at private equity, venture capital, even high net worth individuals that like to invest in small businesses, mm -hmm. they face capital gains upon making an exit. A lot of them invest in small private businesses and realizing that nine out of 10 of their investments, they could end up seeing nothing back. Like the, the, these uh, nine out of 10 investments are going to end up failing and therefore they're going to have to write those investments down to zero. So they want to be rewarded for the few that do pick up, the, for the few that actually make successful exits. So in their situation as well, they're looking at this and going, well, I'm retaining a lot less reward for the risk I am taking for writing these checks and making these investments. So I'm not sure if I want to take these risks anymore. Um, maybe I will go to a more favorable jurisdiction where I can make these investments and reap more of the rewards in that situation. So even from an investment perspective, this can be catastrophic. Yeah, Daryl, I mean, you talk to business owners on a day-to-day -day basis. You work on capital raising as well as obviously on tax side. I'm curious what they're saying to you right now. I mean, what are the conversations that you're having with your clients in these new regulations? Well, you know, I work mainly in Canada and um, I have some clients in the U.S. as well. So my Canadian clients have said, you know, we realize this is not a fantastic place when it comes to tax. We like some of the benefits here in the country, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of them have contemplated moving to the U.S., especially my Canadian clients that have majority U.S. clients and are doing business in the U.S. and traveling there all the time. As a result of this new rule coming up in Canada, a bunch of them are saying now, well, with this change, uh, the decision's even becoming easier. If they were on the fence and they were about to pull the trigger to make a move to the U.S., then they're going to do it. A lot of them are going to make that move and go south of the border. Granted, the, the U.S. government doesn't make changes to the long-term capital gains tax rule, which remains still unaffected based on the announcement from Biden. But you could see a flight of capital, a, a brain drain in terms of entrepreneurs and small businesses moving to more favorable jurisdictions. Yeah, it's so difficult out there just to stay afloat these days. And that brings me to my next point. You know, there's a perception 
that these tax hikes target the ultra rich, you know, that we're somewhat out of touch. People in the business community, you you need to pay this, you need to pay this. I'm curious, though, if there's a potential for, you know, broader ramifications here. Really break down how this might affect the middle class and also this perception out there and how we can break it. Right. Um, capital gains affects anybody who owns an asset. If you own an asset, uh, and now you no, know, the exception of your primary home, but if you have an investment uh, property, if you own stocks, if you own a private investment in a private business, all of these things get affected. And it's not only wealthy people that have them. Now, do we impact wealthy people? Of course we do. Well, it does affect uh, the, a lot of the assets that I just mentioned, but it also affects the middle class that have any assets uh, in, in that could be subject to capital gains tax. And from my perspective, I'm an entrepreneur. I am not wealthy. But I started the business because I saw a gap in the marketplace. I mm -hmm. saw that there was a gap in the accounting industry, and I thought I could do it better. Like other entrepreneurs, we jump into business because we believe we can offer a product or service that consumers would like, and we can make the country better. So we jump into this, but I know that where I'm trying to get to is to grow my business to a 5 to $10 million business and sell in the future, which is the mindset of most business owners. So this impacts me directly as well, even though I don't have that wealth today and the capital gains doesn't affect me as much today, it could certainly affect me tomorrow and affect my decision on where I want to be when I decide to pull the trigger and sell my business. Yeah. And, and don't you think it's just, you know, we're allowed to creatively build businesses and profit off of them. This is just capitalism. Have we taken a step back? We just mentioned that this is the highest proposed tax since the 20s in the US. In Canada, it's taking it to a whole next level. Uh, are we going backwards in a time where our economies are basically doomed and our GDP is going down? I think it's unfortunate. I mean, I, I, what happened was COVID came and the government just started writing blank checks. Yeah. And obviously pumped so much money to the economy, which is what caused the inflation. And now we're in that ratchet back period where the government has realized that they overreached on spending and need to cut back. And it's very unfortunate that they're making decisions to cuts to on capital gains in this area that is going to impact innovation, research and development, entrepreneurship, small business. Um, and it, this is just one area where we are saying, don't make cuts in this area. This is not the right, right space. We need to be pushing more innovation. We need more R&D going on. We need to be creating jobs. And this effectively is doing the opposite. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I saw an article today. There's a lot of talk up in Canada in headlines about doctors pushing against this bill because, of course, their business runs as a corporation and any profits are capital gains. Uh, you know, there might be less sympathy for entrepreneurs that are making billions of dollars and things like this. But when it comes to a country that has public health and we're taxing the doctors even more and they're saying we're going to leave Canada, what's the impact? I mean, this goes larger, I guess, is my point than it seems. It goes larger because it's not just doctors, it's generally practitioners, occupational therapists, dentists, hairstylists sometimes. But there are a lot of people in the gig economy in Canada that are set up as sole proprietors and function as a single person company effectively, and not like sole, sole proprietorship. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these people are set up like many businesses. Um, and even though they are one person on contract, so every one of these professions is impacted because the capital gains directly impacts this group of people. So even if you're not sympathetic to doctors because you know there's a perceived uh, there's a perception that doctors make a lot of money, you have to look at photographers. You have to look at any entrepreneur set up as a sole proprietor that is going to face the exact same issue and it's going to be thinking of the exact same things that I just mentioned. Is this the right country for me? Is this the right place to be based on the current tax system? Should I be looking somewhere else to set up? Yeah, no, fascinating. And I know we always lose a few people when we talk about our taxes, our favorite topic. Daryl Ching, a chartered financial analyst and the managing partner and CEO at Vistance Capital Advisory, joining us today to break it all down. Thanks for coming on, Daryl. Hopefully we didn't lose anyone with all this jargon. I hope not. Also, Jeremy, I, I have a, I have, I'm very good at putting people to sleep, but today I put on <laughs> my jacket, I had my coffee, and I decided I'm going to try to make it as interesting as possible. Cheers, my friend. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. I'm Jeremy Safran. Thank you for your time.
back home as well for all of us here at Kiko News. Thanks for watching. Go like that video, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.